You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We're going to be talking today, following our line of helping businesses thrive in California, helping business owners to get what they want from their business. We have invited uh, Chuck Berman. Uh, uh, Chuck is a uh, financial advisor for Guardian Life Insurance Company of America. They do securities and investing through Park Avenue Securities. And now, this is a subsidiary of the Guardian Life Insurance Company. And uh, that what we're going to be talking about today are things that business owners should be thinking about in terms of their personal and business success. It, don't take this uh, as advice. This is a, a conversation that we're having here for informational purposes only. Uh, what we really want you to do is to take this seriously and find a financial advisor that you trust that can help you accomplish the kind of things that we're talking about today so your business can thrive and so that you can get what you want from your business. So, Chuck, welcome to the Pilgrim on the 405. Welcome. Thank you very much, Will. I appreciate you having me on the show. What would you like to address? Well, well Chuck, you know, I... I We've known each other for a while, and I know that you didn't grow up in Southern California. So tell us how you got here. Well, I spent most of my life in New York City in the real estate and construction industry, working with the best of the best and the worst of the worst business-wise. And after the collapse in 2008, I decided it was time to get out of that industry and go into something where I could actually help people. And I found that financial advice seemed to be an area which people were really lacking a lot of help in and needed some help and with my business background i felt that i could do that so how did you get out to california well we have four daughters and the daughters with the grandchildren are on the west side of the country so we decided to see if we could make the move west and my wife's company offered her a transfer to south coast plaza in beautiful orange county and here we are that's how we made it across yeah, you know that's that's not unusual we were living in the western massachusetts and when our son made us a grandparent, my wife said to me, you know, I've been working with kids all of my life and helping parents uh, 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 support their kids. She said, I'm not going to live 2,000 miles away from my first grandson. And so she said, uh, could we, you know, could we move, if I could find a job in California, could we move? And, of course, I said, well, sure, <laughs> no problem. I, you know, you find a job in California. Now, this was at a time when, when it was tough to find jobs. Yeah, if you find a job in California, well, you know what happened. Six months later, we are driving out from Western Mass. Once my wife got that approval from her company, <laughs> everything just went right. The move went perfectly. Everything went on time. And I ended up with an excellent organization out here, too. Yeah, well, that's great. And the same thing happened to me. I remember driving down uh, from Corona Del Mar, driving down Pacific Coast Highway, uh, six months before we were to, to uh, arrive here, and my wife looked at me and said, well, now, just what is it that you're going to do when we get here in September? <laughs> Which meant we had to scramble, but we found a great time. Had a, we've been having a great time for the last 25 years. Now, one of the things that, uh, that, that you and I have talked about a lot is business owners work very hard to develop their business, to increase the revenue, to... Uh, increase the, the the productivity of their employees. But sometimes if they're not paying attention to what's going on with the money for their family, they can get into trouble, right? Uh, business owners, like most people in general, uh, turn around and basically neglect the areas that they need to. Not because they want to, but they're so focused on growing their business and reinvesting everything into the business that they wake up short on money. But now... People don't generally have time to do that. If their focus is on their business, very often that's that takes a lot of time just to make that business work. So what should they be doing? Oh, they should be spending a little bit of their time talking with a good financial advisor and putting together a plan that gets them organized, protected, and set for the future, especially thinking toward retirement. What does it mean to be organized financially? Well, most people aren't organized. The average husband and wife have between 10 and 25 accounts with moving balances. Bills come in each month. They sit down with their checkbook or their computer. They pay the bill, 
and they put it in the proverbial kitchen junk drawer. The next time they see it is when they go to see their tax advisor for income tax, and they walk into their tax advisor's office with this little shoebox or a large box of documents, and they dump it on their desk, and in essence, what they're saying to their tax advisor is, go fix what I did last year. We force our tax advisors to work through the rearview mirror as opposed to looking out through the windshield. Well, now, now we've, we've had uh, both Hugo and John Gonzalez, CPAs, mm-hmm. and Gonzalez CPA, on, on the show, and both of them have talked about how important it is to be spending time in the last quarter of the year not just looking backward but looking forward. Is that what you're talking about? Um, I'm talking about when you turn around and you do certain things during the year and you don't tell your tax advisor about it, and then you sit down before the next April, and it's time to figure out what you actually owe in taxes, and your advisor says, gee, I wish I would have known that you were doing this last year when we could have done something about it. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way that I can keep my tax advisor well-informed of what's going on during the tax year, they may say, you know what, I see you're trending this way. Maybe we should make some adjustments so we won't owe as much next year. And that's where we try to get to. Okay. So what's the relationship that you as a financial advisor would have with a CPA or a bookkeeper? Well, uh, we have a lot of CPAs that we work with because a lot of times they'll refer clients to us who need help with organization, who need help with getting themselves properly protected for the simple reason. They've worked hard to build the assets they have. You don't want to be in a position where you make a mistake, end up in a lawsuit, and all of a sudden the assets you've worked so hard for belong to somebody else. Well, uh, thinking about that, when uh, when we consider that in Southern California, a business owner living here, chances are, has a significant amount of equity tied up in his home. I would think in the home, and also they've probably invested a lot into their business. And if they were to be sued, how would they avoid losing, putting all that, uh, that, that equity in, in, at risk? Well, by having proper liability insurance. Now, liability insurance is something that I don't sell, nor does my company sell. But we coach people on how much liability insurance they should have. Most people turn around, insure their car. They'll have $100,000, $300,000 coverage, and they have assets equaling a million dollars. They get into an accident that's their fault. They go to court. The insurance company says, we're here to write a check for $100,000. The other six or $700,000 is your problem, comes out of your assets. Mm -hmm. By getting a proper umbrella policy to cover over the automobile policy and the home policy, you can help that person protect their wealth. Mm -hmm. All right, so now is that... Whose whose role is it to advise uh, a business owner or a family of of that vulnerability? Uh, Well, their liability insurance agent should be doing that. But in most cases, we find that if they've tried to, it hasn't gotten through to the person. And first thing we do, first meeting we have with a client is coach them on getting themselves properly protected before we even move forward to help them try to grow wealth because we don't want to take a chance on losing anything that we've helped them accumulate. Well, talk to me about when you meet with a client. What are the goals that you have over the first three to six months? Well, we want to first do a very, very in-depth fact-finding with the client because every client is different, and you can't make any assumptions that there are any similarities. Also, each different family is going to have different goals and needs. And it's by doing an extremely careful analysis that you're able to turn around and come up with proper recommendations that are appropriate for that specific individual. These are all like snowflakes, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and and so one of the one of the things I find so interesting is that that business owners who have a lot of expertise in terms of the the product that they're creating or the service that they're providing or maybe even the organization that they're running, they're, they're very skilled at that. And then they, they sometimes tend to believe that that means that they can take care of their own financial goals and systems and um, accountabilities. Some people are very, very capable of doing that, but most aren't. And most people are disorganized. They don't know what the requirements are. Like, 
How do you know how much life insurance to purchase? Well, you need to do a human life value calculation and figure out how much money that person is capable of earning for the rest of their life and then use that as an appropriate measure for the amount of insurance that you might want to put together. Most people will just pick a number out of thin air and you find out at the wrong time that that number is not necessarily enough to cover what you need to send the kids to college, to keep the family in the home that you want them to stay in. These are really important goals for a family. And so uh, it seems to me that part of what you do, now correct me if I'm wrong, but part of what you do is you help help a, a family, a business owner and a family, get clear about what they expect over the next 10 to 20 years. Well, we can't forecast that far down the road, but what we can do is we can start to make projections for the first three years out and also looking at long-term goals like retirement and start to teach the people, after we've gotten them properly protected, how to become a world-class saver. All right, so why is that important? Well, having liquidity allows you to take advantage of opportunity. And so many people turn around and tie their money up in things that they can't get to it when they actually need it. Some people will buy their own home, and then they'll start to invest in real estate, and they'll have every penny tied up in real estate, like we saw in the last financial crisis. And then the real estate's value went down, and they were stuck. We want people to be diversified and have money invested into what we call buckets, but different buckets some for retirement, some for growth, some for emergency. Every family should have a minimum six-month rainy day plan to have enough cash on hand to support that family for six months should somebody lose a job, somebody become ill, so on and so forth. So when you say world-class saver, does that mean does that mean world-class, meaning that's organized in these buckets that I want you to tell me more about, or is it that I am taking a percentage of all of my revenue that comes in on a monthly basis and putting that someplace. Well, organized into different buckets, very important. But our goal is to get people to save 15 to 20% of their gross income, which is a lot of money. But once they have that type of liquidity, it makes them capable of doing some significant things financially. Well, why is it that people, what do you think is, is getting in the way of that? I mean, that would seem obvious to me. Well, a lot of people don't do planning because they keep putting it off until tomorrow. And then they put it off until tomorrow. And they were 30 when they should have started doing their planning. And now they're 55 and they've done no planning. And they don't have assets in the correct buckets for retirement. And now they're starting to worry about, hmm, how many more years am I going to be able to work? Will I have enough money so that I don't outlive my assets while I'm here? Well, how do you know what enough money is? Uh, there is no way to know exactly what enough is. So we try to come up with strategies where we can guarantee a lifetime stream of income that will allow them to live a particular lifestyle if they're fortunate enough to have enough money. Now, I have been hearing a lot in the news and, and, and uh, strategy magazines that I pay attention to about the lack of savings and the lack of liquidity, in fact, the lack of preparation for retirement that lots of baby boomers have. Is that true? Absolutely, and it's a shame. But many people turned around and only saved 5% a year as opposed to 10 or 15 or 20. They wake up 30 or 40 years later after working, and they've only got 5% left. And they're sitting with a half million dollars, And they're probably going to live another 30 years. A half a million dollars is definitely not enough money to provide the things those people will need for the next 30 years. So what do we see going to happen in the next 20 years? Um, You're going to see a lot of people that are in trouble. And we're trying to educate as many people as we can right now to become smarter savers and to plan for that future retirement. Is it too late for baby boomers? It's not too late for all of them. For some of them, it will be a tough battle. But for others, if they can start to wisely look at what they have and work with a good advisor to put it into a proper plan, we'll see if we can stretch it as far as we possibly can to cover them. So how important is it right now for everyone to have a financial plan? I think anyone who doesn't have a plan is going to be lost 
and it will be too late to make changes down the road. I, I think that people who will just sit down with a good financial advisor, listen to what they have to say, will probably have a couple of light bulbs go on and say, hmm, that makes sense. Maybe I should readjust my strategies this way because I need to protect myself for the longevity. Or maybe I should have some strategies. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, so how does one pick out a good financial advisor? What, how does somebody who has not ever worked with a financial advisor know who would be a good financial advisor? Well, I think you need to turn around and do some checking on your advisors. Uh, that can be done very, very easily at a website called BrokerCheck.com, which is the FINRA website, which every person who is in my business is listed there. And they list how you are licensed, what company you're with, and do you have any events that uh, may have caused some concern by other clients. So BrokerCheck. BrokerCheck. Brokercheck.com, that's one piece. Yep. What, what else can people use? I think you need to speak to friends and family and find out people who've had good experiences with specific advisors. And then I think you need to meet with those advisors and pick the one where the chemistry is going to work out right between you and that person. Because how you get along, how you feel about each other has a lot to do with how successful your relationship will be with that advisor. Well, now... Um, are most advisors trying to sell people on their services? Some do. We don't. Our process is we educate people. And should there be a product that we carry that's appropriate along the way and the client can actually use it, we'll then make that available to them. But our first step is we educate people. We teach them about money. We teach them about planning. And we have a very, very interesting software platform called the Living Balance Sheet, which is a brilliant piece of software that actually allows the layman to see their whole financial world laid out on one page at one time, and it can be updated on a daily basis over the Internet so that you can keep your tax advisors aware of changes that happen during the year in a very, very simple way. All right, so we've talked a little bit about why people should have financial advisors. We've talked about the value of savings. We've talked about having a plan, mm -hmm. not just <laughs> if for many, many, uh, many of the baby boomers. It seems to me that, that in talking with them that it's not so much as a matter of altering their strategies. It's getting them to come up with strategies. Well, a lot of times they've had a strategy. Uh, that they were able to turn around and live on 4 or 5% of the money that they've saved up each year. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, 2008 comes around, and interest rates go the lowest we've ever seen them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that money that was working so hard to generate the right amount of capital for them to live isn't capable of generating that type of money for them. And all of a sudden, there are shortfalls. And now people have to start tapping into the principal, and that's a downhill battle. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about why it's important to have strategies and to make these plans, we take a break here and, and hear from our sponsors. When we come back, let's talk about some specific strategies that people can, can use and the kind of things that you can help them with as a financial advisor. All right? Sure. <laughs> Hi, it's time for another tip from Sandler Training. Traditional sales training teaches techniques on how to eliminate stalls and objections. Some are fancy sales moves, while others are programmed responses. Sales is a conversation, and I don't know how you can memorize every possible response for every sales situation. Also, the prospect has usually heard these responses before and has been turned off by some fancy sales move. When you really think about it, the only person qualified to address the stall or objection is the prospect. Ask the right questions and you will eliminate stalls and objections. And that's another tip from Sandler Training, finding power through reinforcement. All right, back to Will and his guest. And so we have been talking with Chuck Berman, uh, financial advisor 
And and we've talked about having strategies for for a lot of us baby boomers. Having strategies going to carry us through this this thing called retirement. This thing that when we're no longer working in the same way that we have been before. And I want to spend a little time with Chuck now talking about specific things that people can do. Now, of course, this is going to be general. It, it, and, not, and remember, this is informational. This is not advice. We're not giving advice here. We're asking you to find people that you can work with so that you can create your own strategies. But we're going to talk about some of the areas you should be looking at. So we're going to start off with this, this notion, Chuck, I've heard you talk many times about having different buckets of money. So tell us a little bit about what that means to you. Well, when I sit down with a person and talk about how they should start to plan to assemble their wealth, um, I first explain to them that there are basically four buckets. And the first bucket I start off with is their short-term bucket. And that's the bucket that needs to have a minimum of six months emergency cash in it and should also have or be planning to be filled with the next two to three years of major purchases. That's the short-term bucket. The long-term bucket is where your retirement funds go. That's where your 401k money, your Roth IRA money, so on and so forth will go. And then you have the midterm buckets one and bucket two. Midterm bucket two is for your investments. Midterm bucket number one is where you would put a vehicle like pure dividend-paying whole life insurance, which has cash value. And basically what happens is you live out of your bucket number one. You don't want to touch your long-term bucket. You don't want to touch your midterm bucket number two until you're at retirement. When an emergency comes up, you can go to your short-term, your, your midterm bucket number one and actually borrow against a whole life insurance policy if you're in a jam and don't have enough money in your primary bucket. Does that make sense, Well, Yeah, it makes sense to me. Okay. And, and now, but didn't you say you had four buckets? Well, the short term, midterm one, midterm two, and long term. What is midterm two then? Midterm two is where your investments are. If you're invested in the market, have equities, real estate, so on and so forth. This would be your home. Yeah, your home. And possible properties that you're buying for income-producing gain. Now, can't can't you do the same thing in terms of borrowing against uh, your 401k or your your investment money? In t- I mean, in terms of, of long-term uh, retirement money. I don't know that you really want to borrow against the long-term retirement money. I think that's a bucket that just needs to be left as a safety, and you need to try to deal out of your short-term bucket. Or your midterm one. All right. So in terms of uh, in terms of our um, uh, our midterm two bucket, our in, uh, investment in home real estate. Sure. Uh, what what's the difference? I'm getting a lot of traffic across and through my mail and about uh, trying to convert my 30 year mortgage into a 15 year mortgage. Why would I want to do that? I don't know that you necessarily would. And when we talk to most people. The largest tax deduction you will ever have in your life is your home mortgage. And many people turn around and say, well, gee, what if I do a 15 instead of a 30? Well, that mortgage payment's going to be a lot higher. You're cutting the tax deductions lifespan in half. And you also have an opportunity loss on the additional money from the higher payment. You might be able to generate more income if that money were invested in something else. So there's a lot to be considered between which mortgage is correct, but the same is not the right advice for every person. And and, uh, what we hear on on the television or in the newspapers and ads is not necessarily advice. That might be somebody trying to sell us something that's going to profit them. It's always somebody trying to sell, and here's the problem. Everyone's financial future is different, and it's so important that a person receives suitable recommendations. That's why you can't go by ads. Ads are a good thing to stimulate your imagination and make you ask some questions. But you should really speak to a professional before you go ahead with any of these things. And that's why a good financial advisor would be the right place to go. Well, now, a lot of, a lot of people are uh, working in companies that will match their contributions to 401ks. 
um, I assume that someone should be should be maximum contribution. So if there's matching there, right? Well, let's look at 401ks and let's first understand where they came from. If you go back to the 1970s, there was no such thing as a 401k or an, most people had nothing or they worked for a company that offered a pension. Pension plans evaporated in the 1970s. I believe only 2 or 3% of the companies in this country still issue plans, and I don't want to go into why they are not anymore, but the United States government panicked when companies stopped issuing pension plans because they felt that everyone would then rely on Social Security for their retirement. Social Security was designed in 1937 when you retired at age 65, and most people passed away between the ages of 68 and 69. Well, they found in the 70s that people were living a lot longer than 68 or 69. Hence, they formed the qualified plans. Now, if you were in your 20s in the 1970s, and you fully funded your 401k plan, and you're ready to retire now, well, the high tax bracket back then was in the 70th percentile. Mm. And right now, the high tax bracket's in the 40th percentile. You've hit a home run. You deferred paying taxes when taxes were really high. Now you're ready to retire, and you're drawing on these funds when taxes are much lower. But now I look at today. Taxes are near an all-time low. The only time taxes were lesser than they are today were during the Great Depression and right after the dot-com crash. So I say to people, maybe we should turn around and look at a different strategy because we don't know if taxes are going to go lower or higher, but the government needs a lot of money. We've got about $20 trillion in debt. We've got a health care situation that we don't know how to address yet. We've got a broken Social Security system. So getting back to your question about the match point, that's about as high as I would want to invest into my 401k. And maybe I take the rest of the money and I pay my taxes today and I put it into a vehicle where I'll never pay taxes again on principal or accrual, something like a Roth IRA. Mm. So a different vehicle. Exactly. But we're still still saving. Always saving. Mm -hmm. Continue to save and save and save and you will live a much nicer lifestyle. Well, now, kids with, uh, you know, you, you talked about people 30, 35, mm-hmm. 40. Uh, how do they plan for what would be a way of planning for uh, providing for their kids' college education? I mean, that just seems to be an enormous thing today. They have to start saving. It's very, very important to start saving as soon as you possibly can. Funding major life events college educations, the cost in general of children, uh, weddings, bar mitzvahs, so on and so forth. These are all things that cost a lot of money, and you can't just wake up tomorrow and say, hmm, do I have enough in the bank? The odds are, if you didn't plan for it, you're probably going to come up short. So planning early on is the way, saving early on is the way to turn around and achieve these goals. So what is the goal of uh, a financial plan then? Talk to me about what should be the, uh, you know, the the long-term plan. I mean, what's the goal of that long-term plan for somebody looking to come up with a strategy? The final goal is to be able to live your life out in a way that you feel comfortable being able to live, and that's going to take a significant amount of dollars. That's the long-range goal. All of the things between now and then, getting married, having children, college education, so on and so forth, each need to be planned into that process. And the plan needs to be able to morph and change over time because life events present themselves. Well, and, and don't we have don't we have this extension of life from, uh, I mean, uh, it seems to me that looking at the pensions that were put together back in Detroit, uh, that really, and the, you know, the promise was if you if you do all this hard labor, uh, repetitive screwing in the bolts and moving these heavy pieces of uh, of metal, you do that for 25, 30 years, and then you get to do whatever you want to do, right? Yes. And what we found out was that when people retired, they only lived three or four years, and that was how they created. The pension, expecting that to happen, but as the health care 
And as people begin to take care of themselves better and the lifespan extended, that's where we got into trouble with pensions, right? We have a big, big problem that people are living a lot longer than it was ever anticipated. If you are married today, you have a good chance of living into your 90s. They mm-hmm. just find that married couples seem to live longer than individuals. Well, there's more to live for. Exactly. <laughs> but what we also find out about retirement is every day becomes Saturday. Mm-hmm. Saturday is the day of the week that people spend the most money. Ooh, I see. When you're not busy working and you've got idle time on your hands, well, what are we going to do? It costs money to do things. Ah, so we're the ones who are going to be funding the consumer rush. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And as long as you have enough money to pay for the things you want to do, you're in excellent shape. It's when you start coming up short because you didn't plan properly. That's where it becomes an issue. Very interesting. All right, so so how can how do people ensure that they won't run out of money before they run out of lifetime? Well, after they've become a good saver and they've planned their life events correctly and they've been able to accomplish them, they have to start thinking about how am I going to preserve my money? And one of the ways of preserving money is with guarantees. If we look at Social Security today, even though it's not providing all that much money, you don't actually have a bank account with the United States government that you can look and see how much money is in my account. The only thing that the government will turn around and tell you is that if you retire at this particular age, based on your contributions, you will receive a monthly benefit of X. But that's guaranteed until you've moved on to the rest of your future. Or until somebody on the Potomac decides to change it. Well, we hope that won't happen, but we've got a plan for changes in that because that system is broken. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our clients, as they're starting to plan for retirement, we will recommend vehicles if they're suitable for that particular client Mm -hmm. that will turn around and guarantee a cash stream for the rest of their life. And that's one of the ways of guaranteeing that a person will be able to live the lifestyle that they would like to. So now when we think about, I've heard the term exit strategy. Why why is that important for a, a business owner to have an exit strategy? Well, it's something that a business owner should start planning shortly after they open their business. And when I say to the business owners, Gee, you've just opened. You should start planning an exit strategy. They look at me like I have three eyes. (laughs) And what we find is most business owners wake up one day, usually in their 60s, and say, you know what? Enough. I don't want to work anymore. I want to sell my business. And they want to sell their business in the next 90 days. And they're talking to their friends at the country club or at the yacht club, and they're saying, What do you think my business is worth? (laughs) And they're getting a recommendation from a dear friend Mm -hmm. who probably knows nothing about their business. Mm -hmm. And the first thing, you end up with a value that may not be as accurate as it should be. Well, and and as as a business owner plans on uh, exiting or selling his business or her business, it, it seems to me that some of the things they need to be thinking about is it's not, your business is not just evaluated in terms of your cash flow. Nope. Uh, that, that the business, if you are one of the leaders in that business, if you're talking about exiting, leaving, you are taking a great part of the value of that business away when you leave if you haven't planned for how that transition is going to happen. Exactly. And, and that's why it's so important to sit down with a good financial planner at least minimum five years before you want to sell that business and start to come up with a plan and do the things that will put the business into the proper shape to be sold so that you can maximize the amount that you get for the sale of your business. Well, in my experience, you certainly want to have people in place who are managing that business and who can carry that business forward without you. Yes, And you certainly want to have people who want to be there, who are capable of being there, 
and understand where the business is going so that that becomes part of the value that is purchased when the value is purchased. Well, there are things like that. And then also there could be some negatives that need to be corrected. I mean, many business owners turn around and uh, live a lot off of their business. Mm -hmm. It pays for the bill for the country club or the yacht club or the Mm -hmm. so on and so Mm -hmm. forth. Well, when when a prospective buyer sees that, "Mm, well, there's three or four hundred thousand dollars a year coming out covering these particular bills, that's not going to happen in the future. That's right. That's right. So the business has to be properly positioned so that all of the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and it's put into the best possible shape to get the highest value. Well, then uh, another piece that's it's always important is to have all those business processes that make that business work documented. And, and, and I always envision that like a three-ring binder that says, this is how this business gets to its vision. This is how we accomplish where we're going. That makes a lot of sense. But but another thing that you really need to do is I am a team player and I have a number of people in my organization that I will bring on to specific client accounts when it's the right time. And I have a person on my team that is a certified exit planner. And I think anybody contemplating the sale of a business needs to work with a certified exit planner. Mm -hmm. Very, very important part of the process. And whenever I've had a client who who wants to be coached on what do I do for my business, I will bring this team member into play. All right. So, Chuck, tell us us some stories about maybe people have been successful, maybe people have been not successful. But tell us some stories about about, uh, people who have contemplated their, their financial future? Well... It was very interesting. When I first got out here to California, I was at a breakfast for the Santa Ana Chamber of Commerce, and sitting next to me was a a nice attorney at a table, and we seemed to hit it off pretty well. And uh, he said, you know, I have a couple of clients I might want to refer to you. And I said, okay, I greatly appreciate that. What I'd like to do first is meet with you to go over my process so that you understand what I will show your people. We met. And a week later, I get a phone call, and this attorney tells me he's got a friend who has a business opportunity. And the friend was speaking to some people who claimed to know what to do three, four months ago, and now it's time to pull the trigger, and they don't know what to do. So he has his friend call me, and a person describes their opportunity, that they have an opportunity to make a private investment in a company that will probably be sold in two or three years for a lot more money. And they want to do it with funds from their 401k plan. So I said to the person, you need to come see me. I need to do a full questioning of all your financial background before I make a recommendation because the recommendation's got to be suitable. So the person meets me the next day. We go through everything. And they say, well, you know, if you turn around and you use your money from your 401k plan and you roll the stock in and it becomes worth a few million dollars, you're going to have significant tax liabilities because that would be classified as income, which at today's prices, about 35% tax. I said, maybe the best strategy for you is to take a loan against your 401k plan, use the proceeds of the loan to buy the stock so that when it goes up, you're only exposed to a 15% capital gains tax. Mm -hmm. He said, do you mean to tell me that these people were going to allow me to do that and basically commit tax suicide? I said, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so he went ahead with the transaction by taking the loan, and it worked out very, very nicely. You know, and these are important things to do from people, but you can't make a recommendation like that over the telephone after knowing a person for only 30 seconds. Right. You right. actually have to get to know them and meet with them. Good. All right. Other stories. Oh, um, I was working with a client who needed to get some more life insurance and just had a new child. And we put in an application. And it came back that the client had had colon cancer six years before, but had never gone for their final PET scan. True. So the rating that the insurance company was able to give them was very, very expensive. So I spoke to the person and I said, "Um, can I ask you why you never went to get the final PET scan? And he said, because I'm afraid they're going to find cancer again. Ooh. 
And I said, I can understand your concern. I said, but you're now telling me that this policy is too expensive and you're going to let it lapse. I said, why don't you go and get the scan? Worst case situation, if the cancers come back, at least you've got the life insurance coverage now. Mm -hmm. I said, best case situation, you're clean. And we go back to underwriting and have them reevaluate the case and lower the premium. Mm. So he gnawed on it for a while and said, okay, I'll do it. Well, about a week and a half later, I get a phone call saying, I need to see you today. I said, why? He said, I need to give you a hug. <laughs> he said, my PET scan came back completely clean. Uh, so, I mean, and that's what you want to hear. I mean, it was, it was just so heartwarming to hear that. And he actually ended up buying more insurance because of it. <laughs> well, you know, what I, what I am wondering is, I wonder if a lot of the resistance to financial mm -hmm. planning has to do with an inability to ask for help. A lot of people are in that position. And one of, one of the worst things that I experience is when I ask a person, do you understand? And I know that they don't have a clue, but they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to come across as not understanding. And it's really important to be able to put things into a format for people that they're actually able to comprehend what you're talking about. It is just so critical. Well, yes, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, what I'm wondering is, I'm wondering that somehow, it, maybe it's baby boomers or maybe it's men or, or maybe it's just the way we are as a, as a culture, but this inability to, to ask for help seems to me to go, uh, go against what I've observed is, is really the way that the way we've been put on this earth, that, that in a, in a real sense, we weren't put here to make it alone. We were put here to work in a community, to work together. Uh, when I build my expertise, I'm neglecting, goodness, 98, 99% sure. of the rest of the world. And I need to have other people who have their expertise. It's, it's sometimes it's just very, very difficult for a person to turn around and admit that they need help. And to go ahead blind and try to guess at what the right solution is to your problem, the odds are you're probably going to guess incorrectly. And that's why you have professionals. I mean, when you get sick, you go to a doctor. When you need your car repaired, you go to a mechanic. All right, that there's something there in that what we really want to do is to move beyond the world of being sold to taking a proactive stance and looking for professionals that we can trust who will have our backs, who will be looking out for our best interest, not simply to sell us more products and services. And that's the process that my company uses. If I used any other process... I wouldn't be a member of this company. We educate people. We teach them what they should do. If they would like to do something, it's usually them saying to us, yeah, I, I think we need to do this. And you don't have to sell people. If you treat them properly and you make them feel that you're trying to find out what's in their best interests, it just leads them right to saying, please help me. Right. Right. I mean, I think that's a, an essential essential um, a mindset that that I at least I want to get people to come to in uh, those who are listening to the, to the Pilgrim on the 405 in, in that we take responsibility for our lives but then we also take responsibility for finding those people those organizations those services that will help us thrive that will help us get what we want from our business and from our life but we can't do it alone. No. A lot of times you've just got to swallow your pride and say, I need help from a professional. And it will probably work out a lot better for you and a lot faster for you. Right. <laughs> All right. So let's suppose somebody wants to talk to you, Chuck. Mm -hmm. How can they get in touch with you? Well, they can call me on my phone, which is 914-582-7883. Or they can contact me at my company, Westpac Wealth Partners on my email, which is charles underscore berman at the, T-H-E, 
W is in William, P is in Peter, 2.com, the WP2.com. Great. Is there anything else that uh, you, you want to mention to folks who own businesses and have families? Yeah. Start planning today. Don't keep putting it off until tomorrow. It will never get done, and you really need to be properly protected. Well, thanks a lot, Chuck. We really appreciate you being here uh, and helping people who are listening to uh, take seriously two things. Number one, plan for the future, and number two, get help for those areas that you, you aren't an expert in. Thank you very much for having me on, Will. Really appreciate having you. And so that's uh, another one of these great service providers that we've been interviewing on the Pilgrim on the 405 to help business owners do two things. Number one, to thrive in California, and number two, to help them get what they want from their business. So it's the Pilgrim on the 405. Looking forward to talking with you again next week. been listening to the pilgrim on the 405 with will christ to hear more of the programs in this podcast go to www.willchrist.com